Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is Jim Pardo, currently completing his sixth and final year as Chairman of the Board of Trustees at Chautauqua Institution. Jim is a native of Tidewater, Virginia, attended the University of Virginia where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa and the University of Virginia Law School. He clerked for the U.S. Court of Appeals Fifth Circuit and then joined King and Spaulding Law Firm in Atlanta, Georgia as an associate, later becoming a partner and then a senior partner. His specialty is bankruptcy law. He's had adjunct faculty appointments in this area of bankruptcy. Jim first came to Chautauqua in 1991 and has served on the Board of Trustees since 2006, where he became chairman of the Personnel Committee, later chairman of the board itself. He's married to a Buffalonian and is the father of two daughters. Jim, how did you make your way to Chautauqua? Um, so Mary's from Buffalo, my wife's from Buffalo, and we had a um, summer week where we came to Buffalo to spend with Mary's parents. Uh, it was an absolutely miserable week. Uh, it was hot. Uh, those tiny windows that hold the heat in in the winter also hold the heat in in the summer. And as a result, there wasn't anyone in any of the three generations that was happy. And one of my partners at the time was uh, a Chautauquan, and he said, well, next year, break your trip and come over and see us. And we did, and we fell in love with the place, and we started like everyone else and did the two weeks, which went to three weeks, which went to five weeks, and eventually we bought a place, and the rest is history. And so continued on since then. It has. With the exception of the summer of 96 when Atlanta uh, hosted the Summer Olympic Games, we stayed at home that summer. That's quite understandable. Now, how did you work your way into the Board of Trustees? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was invited to a uh, roundtable discussion of issues, and um, uh, how I was chosen for that is still a mystery. Um, but after that, um, was invited to join as a first as a community member of what was then the Asset Policy Committee, uh, which you'll remember from your service. Uh, I did that for two years, and then I was asked if I would be willing to come on as a full trustee, and and I did, and and. Uh, then I was entering my last year as, as a, uh, a trustee, uh, the eighth year of my uh, tenure, where I would be otherwise term limited. Uh, and uh, I was asked to be uh, chair. I like to say that I missed the meeting where I was elected chair and as a result had no say in it. <laughs> and so here you are. Now, how, generally, how were the trustees selected for the board? Uh, there are two types of trustees. Uh, 20, uh, the, the charter, uh, which was a 1902 charter granted by the state of, of New York uh, and its legislature, uh, prescribes 24 trustees. Uh, 20 of those are chosen uh, by the trustees themselves, and four trustees are chosen by the property owners as members of the Chautauqua Corporation. Right. And, and the term is for how many years? It's, it's, uh, you, uh, it's a term of four years and, and you can serve up to two terms or a total of eight if, if uh, you choose and, and it seems the right thing for the board. Right. Now was there any big remuneration for being on the board? Uh, uh, no, there's not only uh, no big remuneration, there's no small remuneration either. <laughs> no gay ticket, no, 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 nothing. no per diem? No, no, a pat on the back or, or, or a strike around the head if you uh, do uh, uh, something that seems controversial. So it's basically it's a total volunteer It's a complete effort. volunteer effort. Mm -hmm. And the trustees then, I assume, as most nonprofits, generally are expected to make a significant contribution. It would be a big part of their charitable giving. What, what we like to say to our trustees, we are, we are not what people would call a pay-to-play board. It is not mandatory. There is no minimum. And the fact is that we have a wide spectrum of, of economic wherewithal uh, displayed on our board. What we like to say is that um, trustees should make Chautauqua one of their two or three uh, dearest uh, organizations when it comes time in their family uh, to make charitable donations, whether that's year-end or, or periodically or whether it's in a bequest form or, or otherwise. Right. right. And so that works out pretty well. It has. 
And I, most of the trustees then, from my experience, served the entirety of their term. Very few, as I recall, who departed early for some reason. That's Us right. Usually a major conflict of some sort. Well, typically, so, typically it's a it's a, a lifestyle issue. Some some people come to the board later uh, than others, mm -hmm. uh, and and they'll feel comfortable serving a one one full four year term, but don't feel comfortable committing to a second. Mm -hmm. uh, others have personal issues, illnesses of spouses or whatever that mm -hmm. might come up and and cause them to to reassess their commitment. I remember, one person became a college president, and he was. His board said to him, your first priority, your only priority, is this uh, Exactly. He, he lost all of his spare time. And so that's, that's the way it is. Now, um, what are the major activities then of the board? Uh, the board under the charter is responsible for the uh, complete governance of the institution. Uh, it, as it has evolved, uh, that really means, from a trustee standpoint, oversight uh, over the uh, paid administration, Michael Hill, who's the president, and his executive staff. So we try to stay at a strategic level. We try to remain uh, in an oversight mode. We try to avoid getting into operations. Um, but our, our job is to deal with the governance of the institution and to make sure that it functions appropriately. Mm -hmm. How big of a budget is there to uh, we're just short of $40 million uh, in total expenditures. Uh, about 32 of that uh, comes to, will come to us this year in the form of earned revenue. About $8 million will come to us in the form of philanthropy. So it's mostly earned then, isn't it? It's about uh, 78, 78 to 82% uh, uh, has been the swing from year to year uh, with philanthropy being philanthropy being 18 to 22%. And then the earned is normally gate fees? Gate fees, um, uh, ticket uh, uh, fees uh, for uh, single ticket programming, parking fees, and the revenues from food services in the hotel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that seems to work out pretty well then? It has. It's worked well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Jim, tell me what characteristics you're looking for when you bring somebody onto the board? Well, you know, it's interesting. We're, we're looking for someone who has already made a commitment to the institution. Sometimes that takes the form of being a volunteer leader in one of the affinity groups, uh, uh, particularly in the arts area. Uh, sometimes it takes the form of having purchased a home on the grounds. Uh, sometimes it simply takes the form of having been to Chautauqua for any number of years, whether renting or owning. Um, so once you've seen the commitment, then we're looking for skill sets. Uh, so for example, uh, there is a, uh, a dire need on our board uh, in the next year or so uh, for us to find a, um, a CPA because as it turns out, our only existing CPA on the board is going to be term limited next year. So right. we'll look to replace certain skill sets as they become uh, otherwise needed. Right. And that makes, that makes good sense. And how, how was the um, decision made for your replacement? What were the criteria for the new chair? Well, the new chair is, is, was chosen by a special committee of the board. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, it was uh, our standing nominating and governance co uh, committee. They do this uh, job. Uh, the, they, they ask the candidates uh, who had been nominated and, uh, and once, once they confirmed that the nominated candidates were, in fact, committed to going through the process, uh, they asked those who were uh, to write uh, their thoughts on a couple of issues uh, related to Chautauqua, the, what, what the future might look like, what they thought the biggest issue might be, how they would go about solving it, things like that. Then had uh, uh, interviews with each of the three candidates, and then they uh, went off and uh, made their decision. Um, and then they made the recommendation of a single person to the board for election. That, that's normally the way it is. One, that's, that's, one way it's been, that's the way it's been done under our bylaws and charter uh, for as long as, as, as memory exists. Mm -hmm. And, t and uh, I was a little surprised, however, and you'll get this, but I truly thought there would be a continuation of the Cavalier Cabal 
there is, is something to be said for that. Um, Bill Klinger uh, went to the law school. Uh, he was uh, succeeded by George Snyder, who went to the undergraduate school. He was succeeded by me, who went both to the undergraduate school and to the law school. Um, and, and Candy Maxwell, our new uh, chair-elect, uh, did not uh, go to Virginia, or as we have been saying, has not yet gone to Virginia. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have solved that a little bit because uh, the foundation also has a change in, in leadership. Uh, okay. their, their chair uh, uh, is, is rotating off, and the new chair, uh, Tim Rangelian, did go to Virginia. Uh, so we're going to pick up uh, a little bit there. So, yeah, the cabal continues just in a different organization. I, I thought Tim would have been this election, but I'm glad he's doing. He's still in. And I said, now there's a guy who's, got, who's smart, pro Chautauqua, financial background. That'll be the bet. Well, the financial background needs to be at the foundation right now. But so. that's, that's, that's understandable. And some people may not get the joke, but I, a cavalier cabal, some people are just straight face and... and they don't get it. That's all right. Yeah, and um, that it's a it's a particularly good year to have a Cavalier Cabal given the basketball and the lacrosse season. So yeah. there you go. And you're probably going to come down and whoop us all in Research Triangle area and basketball next year too. We you? we could certainly hope for that. Gladly, <laughs> <laughs> gladly. <laughs> well, I sort of took the position as long as it's from the Atlanta Coast Conference, we're probably getting a quality product. Yeah, uh, we hope so. So so that's it. Well, listen, let's switch gears here a little bit. And can you tell me about the strategic plan, how that came about and what you see um, changing in the, in the future as a result of that? Yeah, so uh, interrupt me, otherwise I'll be long-winded. Um, we had an existing strategic plan. As you know, we have had a series of strategic plans, some more formal than others. Mm -hmm. uh, our last strategic plan uh, was adopted in 2010 and ran through 2018. Uh, we started a process uh, in early spring of 2018 uh, where we began uh, input uh, into the process of forming a new plan. Um, we hired a consultant, uh, Bernuth and, and Williamson, out of Washington, D.C., that uh, is particularly skilled uh, with uh, helping not-for-profits uh, in their uh, struggles along these lines. Uh, we formed a uh, combined um, lay committee with a staff committee for a total of 13. There were seven members of the staff uh, and, and six members from the local community, some trustees, some directors, some former trustees, some former directors, and some who have been neither. Uh, uh, and we, we met um, our Input sessions lasted throughout the end of uh, the 2018 season. Um, our consultant uh, did the data compilation uh, work, uh, which was very helpful. Um, we, each of us on the committee received a 100-page executive summary of the data. So you can imagine the amount of underlying data um, beneath uh, that, that summary. Uh, but we learned a lot about expectations. We learned about what people loved. Uh, we learned about what people um, thought important about the place. We made a commitment to the community during last season that we would not alter the mission of the institution. Uh, and, and, and we honored our commitment uh, by, by leaving it as it is. Uh, we think that exploring the best in human values and, and, and engaging in the enrichment of life sums it up fairly well. Um, our work took the form of a series of in-person meetings, typically in Washington because it was a central location for everybody, uh, as well as a number of, of online meetings. Um, and uh, we, we ended up with uh, a plan that we call uh, 150 Forward. Um, 2014, uh, 2024 is our 150th anniversary. Um, and this 10-year plan will take us uh, through 2025 as a midpoint of the plan, so there will be a, a checkup at that point and then five additional years. What I found very, very interesting in the process uh, and, it's, and it's something that, that you and I, uh, because of our, our um, close age, would not have been 
prepared for necessarily is that strategic plans aren't like strategic plans that you and I saw when we were otherwise uh, active in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, those were very business oriented, very step oriented, very timeline oriented, very milepost set. Uh, the, the modern strategic plan is very visionary. So this sets a vision for the institution. It, it, it establishes core values that we think important. And what we did was to find uh, four um, goals that we wanted to focus on uh, for the next three to five years. And we also found four what we refer to as, as cross-cutting imperatives that seem to cut across all of the goals, cut across all of the values, uh, and, and are imperative in the sense that we need to get on with it and, and take a good hard look at those issues. So it's good work. I referred, someone asked me to describe it in 25 words or less, and I told them it was, it was serious work done by serious people, seriously. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the major thrusts then? So the, 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 the key goals, the key objectives, the first is to optimize the, the summer assembly season, the nine-week season that we have on the grounds here in Chautauqua County. Mm -hmm. uh, as Michael uh, Hill likes to say, regardless of whatever else we do, that summer assembly season will always be the most perfect manifestation of what the institution uh, stands for. Mm -hmm. We're going to secondly look at uh, the convening authority that we have in terms of drawing people together to discuss issues. And we're going to try to expand that convening authority both inside the season as well as outside the season, both on the grounds and as well as off the grounds. Now some of that's going to be digital work that will come in the future. Uh, we're looking at shoulder season opportunities. Uh, the folks in Chautauqua County know about the the uh, holiday uh, wonderland that we, we put on on the grounds. We're going to see uh, how we can deal with that. Part of that is mission driven. Uh, part of it, quite honestly, is to look for new revenue sources uh, mm -hmm. because we'd like to take a, a um, uh, have additional revenue sources in order to take the burden off of, of philanthropy around the edges. Mm -hmm. um, third, and I think this is, is this lands Chautauqua, the Chautauqua Institution right in the center of, of, of the Chautauqua County, we desperately want to be a major player and a major lead, leader in establishing a science-based approach to helping uh, to clean the, the Chautauqua Lake um, and to return it to its former glory. Uh, it is critical to the county, it is critical to the institution, and, and we want to be part of that, and uh, we want to be in the forefront of it. Um, we congratulate the county officials uh, for their work on that in, in uh, achieving the coalition that they did in the spring with nearly 20 different municipalities and entities. That's, that's solid first step work, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. And then lastly, we want to grow and diversify our revenues. Uh, we need to do so from a business planning case it will help assure financial uh, sustainability and it will help resiliency. Uh, it also uh, will be to some extent mission driven philanthropy that will come from folks and from entities that may never have, have um, stepped foot on the Chautauqua grounds but who are impressed by the mission and who want to, to help value it. Mm -hmm. So those are the those are the four primary goals. The cross-cutting initiatives, we're going to try to work with strategic partnerships. It's much easier to come up with new programming, new ideas if you're doing it in partnership. We just finished a great week with a, an existing long-term partner, National Geographic, which was wildly successful. Um, we need to mobilize technology. This isn't just putting new laptops on, on folks' desks. This is a major look at technology on the, on the grounds. We have underinvested in technology for a long period of time and we need to get on with that. We have labor and talent solutions that are coming to us from, from two different uh, angles. Historically, we have between 110, 120 or so full-time uh, employees and we grow to over 2,000 uh, during our summer assembly season. Those 2,000 uh, folks come primarily uh, from the local county. The county is shrinking. Uh, the county has other 
opportunities. So it's harder and harder to fill uh, uh, to fill those seasonal jobs. We want to look at that issue. We want to be a leader uh, in the local community. Uh, we have already passed uh, a, a, a livable wage um, resolution at the board level that's that's been implemented for our full-time uh, employees. So we're looking at, 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 in part, it's how to address seasonal labor. And quite honestly, we're also looking at uh, the issue of how we're going to go about filling full-time positions as well. Uh, we have a, a, a nascent uh, Washington office. Um, we are finding needs to be in places other than Chautauqua County. Our principal place of business will always be Chautauqua County. There's, there's, there's no debate about that. But we're going to have to figure out a way uh, to get talented folks uh, either to move to Chautauqua County full time or to, to commute in, uh, at least for the season. So we're going to have to solve that labor challenge. And then lastly, we have an inclusion, diversity, equity, and, and accessibility initiative that we've been running for a couple of years, and we're going to uh, put some emphasis on that as well. So those are the, those are the highlights from the uh, strategic plan. And how has the plan been received? Uh, so far, very, very well. Uh, Michael Hill, Laura Curry, who was the former trustee and former director of the foundation who chaired the committee, and I uh, are doing 11 sessions uh, this summer on the grounds. Uh, and uh, we've done two, three, uh, the, uh, four so far. The fifth one will be uh, uh, Thursday of this week. Uh, and it's been very, very well received. I, I give great credit to Laura and I give great credit to Michael and his staff and I give tremendous credit to our consultant for the work they did in preparation starting in, in the very late winter, early spring of 2018 to collect the information. Uh, because this was a plan for which we received so much input from so many different sources, um, the outcome almost was preordained. Right. Now, let me ask slightly off, but come back to the, under the strategic plan, do you envision major construction of some sorts? Uh, the in, uh, interesting, the answer is I don't know. Uh, the, uh, we had a number of, of inputs, if you will, as I mentioned, and, one of the, and we were running a series of additional uh, working groups or study groups along the way, and one of the things we, we did was to hire a urban planning group out of Pittsburgh who had helped us in the past. And they came in and looked at the 750 acres that we have at the institution. Uh, when people think of the institution, when the average Chautauquan thinks of, of the institution, they think of the 250 acres that are inside the gate on the lakeside mm -hmm. of, of 394. But we have 500 acres on, on the non-lakeside, on the golf course side, if you will. And what we asked our, our consultant to do in that study was to identify the, the highest and best use for each parcel of property that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, the worst thing you could do from a development standpoint would be to build, pick your favorite building, a dance studio, and then 15 years later find out that was not where you should have built the dance studio. A dance studio should have been someplace else, and instead of where you built the dance studio, that should have been the pick another thing, mm -hmm. uh, an additional lecture hall or a, uh, some, some faculty housing. Uh, I would reasonably anticipate uh, that you will see construction and projects emanate from the strategic plan and emanate from the master plan. But when you look at the master plan on a standalone basis, it simply has elevations and schematics and proposals and they are simply one of what could be many ideas. More importantly, uh, we asked them to tell us what this would look like in 50 years. So you've got 50 years of embedded additional mm -hmm. work going on inside this plan. So what, what will be prioritized and, and, and what would go first, none of that's been decided yet. That's going to be my successor's uh, role with her board and, and with, with, um, with Michael and his staff. Right. I, I got two questions open-ended. First, what else do, and I want to switch gears from Chautauqua. What else do we need to talk about Chautauqua Institution? I'm sorry, what else? What else is it critical to talk about Chautauqua? We've covered the plan, the 
tri the board of trustees, how they how they hmm. work. Well, let me let me look at my cheat sheet on on this. And then I've got another question for you. Substantial different change of gears. Yeah. Um, so I would tell you that I, I put two things into the what about Chautauqua. Uh, I want to go back just briefly and make sure that um, the lake uh, and the condition of the lake gets, gets the proper focus. Uh, that's a huge issue for us and it's a huge issue for every municipality around the, uh, the lake and it's a huge issue for every uh, not-for-profit that, that otherwise has a lake focus. And the, and the work that George Borello did in putting the coalition together um, this spring uh, is a tr wonderful first step and we're so very happy to be part of that. So I want to give uh, I want to flag that a second time, even though it's inside the strategic plan, I, I want to give that independent um, mention. And then the other thing is that I, can, uh, I, th I think it's important to note that uh, the assumption inside the strategic plan is that um, we're going to be shifting um, revenue generating issues such that uh, philanthropy is going to serve a larger and larger role. Um, we believe that there are foundations, we believe that there are corporations, we believe there are, are individuals uh, who may never have stepped foot on the grounds of Chautauqua, may never have seen a Chautauqua program, but who are moved by the mission and moved by our work in, in, in the various areas and in particular in the area of civil dialogue and, 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 and democracy initiatives. Uh, if we're able to have the right partners, then I think you're going to see some additional philanthropy come in. And I think some of that philanthropy could be very, very significant in terms of what our budget would be. So those two things would stand out. Right, right. Here's a slightly changed, slight, substantial change of gear, but I thought about this when I was working up the material today. When you and I were both on the Board of Trustees together, we, we had some very substantive conversations about economic difficulties during this recession and people who were in trouble that you saw as, as a bankruptcy attorney. If a young Chautauquan would come to you and say, Mr. Pario, I'm thinking of, of a career in law, what would your advice be? Well, I'd talk to that person uh, and tell them that there could be no better career than a career in law. Uh, but whether you are a practicing lawyer with your law degree or whether you're doing something else with your law degree is, is an issue that that person would need to come to grips with. Uh, when I finished law school, my gracious, I would predict that 90 plus percent of us, uh, perhaps after a, a clerkship or, or two, uh, all wound up going into, into the practice of law, typically uh, the private practice of law as opposed to working for, for corporations right out of law school or, or working for not-for-profits. That's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the skill sets that the modern law schools are teaching uh, to their students is, uh, are, are far more varied than they were when, when I went through school. Um, I will tell you that I'm, I, I miss being a lawyer. Uh, I'm, I'm, I enjoy my retirement immensely, but I'm, I miss the relationships that I formed with other lawyers. I miss relationships I had with my partners. I even missed the relationships I had with, with clients and with judges. Uh, 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 you always love your clients. You may or may not love your judge. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it was a rewarding career for me, and I think it's a rewarding one for youngsters still. That's great. We are out of time, and this has been so much fun. You're nice to ask. I hope, I hope uh, you'll come back again and have another conversation here across the table. That'd be great fun. Great. So much. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye-bye.